Right, so welcome everybody. I'm delighted to um, introduce you to our speaker this afternoon. There you go, so I'll stop. We were waiting for you. <laughs> so I'm delighted to introdu introduce our speaker tonight. Is it one? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, um, who is, uh, he's got a, a double, a joint appointment or double overlapping appointment, uh, but she's a lecturer in ancient um, studies at the University of Birmingham. Did I get that right? Yeah, history. Okay. But she's also um, still finishing a project uh, with the Liverpool um, that is connected to the Institute of Classical Studies um, here in the School of Advanced Study. Um, Hannah, I probably didn't mention even your name, <laughs> Hannah Cornwall, I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. Um, so Hannah Cornwall, um, uh, um, she's got a D field in ancient history from Oxford, the University of Oxford, but also she's working on a monograph on the role of Pax, yes. did I get that right? Yes. Or peace? Yeah. In the political climate of the end of the Roman Republic. Yes, out and in August, hopefully. Oh, there you go. Then. Excellent. <laughs> Brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, but tonight, I believe we're going to get a bit of an insight into the Liverpool project. Yes. Um, that actually focuses on the production of space as a means to understanding diplomacy um, as a social practice in the Roman world. So over to you. Thank you very much. Just jump straight in. And I start with a quite a long quotation from Ammoninus Marcellanus. So then he entered Rome, the home of empire and of every virtue. And when he had come to the rostra, the most renowned forum of the... Ooh, is it going to work? There, there we go, okay. Yeah, the most around forum of ancient dominion, he stood amazed. And on every side on which his eyes rested, he was dazzled by the array of marvellous sights. He addressed the nobles in the Senate House and the populace from the tribunal. And being welcomed to the palace with manifold attentions, he enjoyed a long for pleasure. And then he surveyed the sections of the city and its suburbs, lying within the summit of the Seven Hills, Along their slopes or on level ground, he thought that whatever first met his gaze towered above all the rest. The sanctuaries of Tarpeian Jove, so surpassing as things divine, excel those on earth. The baths build up to the measure of provinces. The huge bulk of the amphitheatre, strengthened um, by its framework of Tibetine stone, to whose top human eyes sight barely ascends. The pantheon, like a rounded city district, vaulted over in lofty beauty, and exalted heights, which rise with platforms on which one may mount and bear the likenesses of former emperors. The temple of the city, the forum of peace, the theatre of Pompey, the odium, the stadium, and amongst these other adornments of the eternal city. But when he came to the forum of Trajan, a construction unique in the heavens, as we believe, and admirable even in the unanimous opinion of the gods, he stood fast in amazement turning his attention to the gigantic complex above him, beggaring description, and never again to be imitated by mortal men. On the 28th of April, 357 AD, the Christian Emperor, Constantius II, entered the city of Rome in an imperial adventus, addressed both the Senate and the people in the traditional political centre of the Roman Forum, in the Senate House and from the Tribunal respectively, and later toured the major sites of the urban landscape. This was the first time since 326, when his father Constantine had visited to celebrate his Vincanalia, that a Roman emperor had entered the city of Rome. The importance of the East as the emerging focus for consolidating imperial power was suggested by the foundation of Constantinople in November 324 AD and the interment of Constantine's body there in May 337. While, whilst Constans, Constantine's youngest son, ruled Italy after his death, he avoided Rome, ruling from northern Italy in the Balkans. The city of Rome as a seat of power had become marginalised. Over the course of the month that Constantine, um, Constantine was in <coughs> Rome, sorry, Constantinus was in Rome, there were a number of different ways in which power and space were negotiated. The centrality of the city, its traditions and the Senate was perhaps bolstered by the imperial adventus, the celebration of Constantinus' 20th year as Augustus, and the premature commemoration of his 35th year as Caesar. Yet it also faced potential competition from the Greek philosopher and senator of Constantinople, 
Themistius, who was sent as an envoy to the emperor and spoke in the Roman Senate House in Greek, treading a fine line between recognising the ancient supremacy of Rome and emphasising the importance of Constantinople as a new, new centre of imperial power. Religious space was also negotiated between Constantius and the Christian community of Rome, who demanded the restoration of Liberius as bishop, and also between the emperor and the Roman Senate. Prior to his visit, he ordered the removal of the altar of victory in the Senate House, at which sacrifices were traditionally made at the start of meetings, thus removing the issue of a Christian emperor having to sacrifice at an altar of another god. The account of the Adventus and subsequent tour described by Ammoninus Marcellinus, with which I opened this presentation, focuses solely on the physical, architectural space of Rome's past, whose size and magnificence stunned the emperor, despite his earlier show of imperial monumentality in his procession into the city. And Ammoninus describes him as showing himself calm as he was commonly seen in his provinces, for he both stooped when passing through lofty gates, although he was very short, and as if his neck were in a vice, he kept uh, the gaze of his eyes straight ahead. Scholarship stresses the fact that Ammoninus was not in fact present in 357, seeing the Adventus of Theodosius in June 389, for which Ammoninus was present, as the basis for the details of his description. Though, as Matthew stresses in his work on the Roman Emperor of Ammoninus, Ammoninus is clearly looking beyond the factual circumstances of Constantius' visit, to give an image of Rome such as would impress itself on any observer. For Ammoninus, Constantius' tour is, amongst other things, an opportunity to present the city's urban heritage and the validity of its history enshrined in its pagan monuments. Constantius, the Roman emperor, is shown to be a stranger to this heritage, with Ammoninus going as far as to compare him to a famous envoy, a legatus, of King Pyrrhus, who had fought the Romans for control of southern Italy in the early 3rd century BC. And Ammoninus writes, And when he was nearing the city, he thought, not like Cineus, the famous envoy of Pyrrhus, that a throng of kings was assembled together, but that the sanctuary of the whole world was presented before him. Now, although Ammoninus contrasts Constantius' view of Rome to that of Cineus, the fact that he chooses to make a comparison is telling. Constantius is in the role of a foreigner coming to negotiate with Rome. Indeed, whilst the idea of negotiation is not emphatically placed at the forefront of Ammoninus' account of Constantius' visit, nevertheless his presentation of the emperor's response to the urban fabric certainly fits into Newman's definition of sublime diplomacy, whereby one diplomatic party draws on a wide range of resources, including aesthetic ones, to overwhelm other parties with one's greatness. Indeed, it is not merely the urban space it is not merely that the urban space presented the emperor with an overwhelming display of architectural monuments to Rome's glorious past, but also the use made of this space by the Senate of Rome. Symmachus, the urban prefect of Rome in 384, stressed in a letter to the emperors that Constantius, despite being of the Christian faith, had willingly been taken by the Senate on a tour through the eternal city of the ancient shrines and temples, reading their inscriptions and learning their origins. In this respect, the Senate used the city to emphasise to the Emperor their integral role as the preservers of Rome's heritage. The urban space articulates the imperial power of Rome, and the weight of its monumental history was something that Constantius could not apparently hope to uh, compete with. However, it did ultimately induce the Christian Emperor to integrate himself into it by erecting an obelisk in the Circus Maximus. The 15th century BC obelisk from Asquan, which is now lost, uh, had intended, been, been intended for the new circus in Constantinople by Constantine. By choosing to erect it at Rome, Constantius was thus assuring the city of its continued relevance and importance as a repository of the monuments to imperial power. It is also worth noting that he completed the basilica on the Vatican Hill over the tomb of St. Peter, thus also aligning himself with the importance of Christian space in Rome. At least in the later literary accounts of the imperial visit of 357, one of the key factors of Constantius' engagement with Rome is the physical architectural space of the city. The spaces and places integral to Rome's past and to the unique identity of the city, as regards the participation of the people, as well as the Senate, are focal points of Ammoninus' presentation, and can be effectively read as the means through which Rome negotiated her position with Constantinus, who, as a virtual foreign envoy to the city, experiences the sublimity, sublim sublimality that the centuries of architectural history provide. 
Of course, Constantinus's own engagement with the physical structures of the city, both in terms of removal and addition, demonstrate how diplomacy and negotiation in turn shape the urban space. In what follows, I will examine the role of the city that the city played in Rome's approach to diplomatic relations and negotiations with other polities and powers. Whilst I will predominantly focus on the Republic and early imperial periods as regards diplomatic space in Rome, the negotiation of the urban space, as the example of Constantinus's visit indicates, was a constant and ongoing process. So first a few words on what I'm interpreting as diplomatic space. As the example of Constantinus's visit illustrates, there appear several different groups interacting with the emperor in order, at least in part, to negotiate their relations with him and to assert certain aspects of their societal and political positions. These diplomatic negotiations are, in a sense, internal debates, as the groups are all Romans and subject to the emperor, as opposed to foreign states negotiating international relations. And indeed, in Ammoninus' account of the visit to Rome, he sort of sandwiches it between uh, an account of negotiations happening uh, through Roman delegates and a series of letters with the Persian Empire in order to secure peace. For the purposes of discussing the nature of diplomatic space, I begin from the definition given by Dundarian in the Oxford Companion to the Politics of the World. Above and before all else, diplomacy is a system of communication between strangers. It is the formal means by which the self-identity of the sovereign state is constituted and articulated through external relations with other states. Like the dialogue from which it is constructed, diplomacy requires and seeks to mediate otherness through the use of persuasion and force, promises and threats, codes and symbols. Whilst Andarian here views diplomacy in terms of sovereign states, which is understandable in a book that focuses on world politics, it can in principle be further broken down to articulate and negotiate the self-identity of different socio-political and socio-religious groups in relation to others, whether the relationship is defined as foreign or civic or indeed even imperial. Building on this notion of self-identity and otherness, Constantinou has stressed that diplomacy's raison d'etre is established only when there are boundaries for identity and those boundaries of identity are crossed. Diplomacy then as a system of communication which takes both verbal and non-verbal forms and a means through which identity of different groups is articulated is inherently spatial. The spatiality is of course a product of social interactions and the meeting point of boundaries of identity, be they political, social, religious or otherwise. Because diplomacy is a product of communication and interaction of different groups, it is, necess 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 no. it is ne necessary to consider it a sighted practice. By this I mean that there are sites of diplomacy whereby a site is a place where some activity has or is being conducted. Such sites may be physical, or in the case of modern diplomacy, virtual, but they are still nevertheless a place shaped by, and which also shape, the nature of the activity being conducted. In examining Rome as a site, or indeed sites, of diplomacy, I wish to consider how the city as a series of physical loci should be understood as an inhabited space that is experienced by its viewers, first and foremost, through the performance of social roles prompted and produced by the architectural framework, and within this framework, how the urban space was used as part of the mediation of otherness. Since William MacDonald's work on ancient architecture and urbanism, which appraises urban environments in terms of the human experience through the analysis of space making and <coughs> urban arm ar armatures, Scholars in the field, field of Roman urban studies have focused on how the ancient city was organised and defined through space and, more recently, movement, both through and to a particular space, in terms of the production of civic identity. And uh, Lawrence, Esmond Clary and Sears talk about the urban production of Roman citizens. Indeed, this serves to remind us that urban spaces are, of course, not merely empty architectural frameworks, but centres of social relations and interactions. Amy Russell, in her recent work on the politics of public space in, the Roman Repub in Republican Rome, has discussed the importance of a behavioural approach to examining urban space, emphasising how the space gave cues to Roman visitors about how they should behave there. Those who could read the cues performed the roles laid out for them, and in doing so they reproduced a set of social norms which created further cues for future visitors. In the forum they acted the role of citizens, and more particularly of citizens belonging to a specific point on the political hierarchy. But the hierarchy itself 
and even the notion of citizenship were products of past performance and could only be understood in the context of performance. Acting like citizens made them citizens, and the cues given by architecture and space were similarly produced by and understood through performance. For Russell, an integral aspect of this behavioural approach is concerned with control over political and civic behaviour in and through space. The control of space was equally important in the production of boundaries between Roman and non-Roman, or indeed even when diplomatic negotiations were carried out solely between Romans. Control of space enabled a control of the performance of diplomacy, and therefore the ability to manipulate and dictate the terms of the negotiation. Before turning to focus on the control of space at Rome as regards the negotiation of relations with other polities and within the empire, I want to highlight the relationship between urban development and diplomacy in the Roman world. It is hardly surprising that Rome's growth as a metropolis appears to coincide with a period of intensification in the interactions and communications Rome had with other communities in the Mediterranean. The Greek historian Polybius, who was notably himself a hostage delivered to Rome after the conquest of Greece, and the defeat of the uh, King Perseus of Macedon in 167 BC, and subsequently remained in the house of the conqueror, Lucius Aemilius Paulus, so was a foreigner domic domiciled living with the conqueror of his country, stressed that diplomacy was a key element within the Roman constitutional framework, which he saw in turn as integral to Rome's ability to conquer the known world within a 53 year period from 220 to 167 BC. It was contact with the Hellenistic world of the Eastern Mediterranean that appears to have generated a desire for new building structures. Interactions with communities from Italy, the Greek East, and Hellenistic kingdoms influenced the development of Rome's central political space, the Forum. The Forum, as a public open space, was the focal point for Roman political activity. It was a space of high visibility and surveillance, a space many wanted to control, a space of memory. It was a space in which political power was exercised in person, both by the political elite, but also the Roman populace. The main architectural features of this political power were the Comitium, which was an open-aired assembly space, the Curia, the Senate House, and the Speaker's Platform, which became monumentalized in uh, 338 BC with a display of captured ship speaks from Rome's victory over Antium, and this is where it gets the name Rostra from. Uh, so the rostra, together with the Curia building, defined the open space of the Comitium. As early as the end of the 4th century BC, there existed another structure which helped to further shape the west end of the Forum space. And Varro tells us of this structure. A little to the right of the rostra, in the direction of the Comitium, is a lower platform, where the envoys of nations who had been sent to the Senate were to wait. This, like many things, was called from a part of it, being named the Grycostasis, that is, the stand of the Greeks. Such a platform suggests that, at least by the fourth century, foreign affairs and the need to make space for embassies and diplomatic activity within the forum space was realized. The platform acted both as a holding pen, as it were, before the ambassador's reception into the Comitium and the Curia before the Senate, but also as a stage on which the foreign embassies might be displayed to Rome. To this we should also add a great number of embassies populating the forum space of Rome during the late 3rd to the 1st centuries BC. And indeed by 67 BC a law was passed ordering that the month of February be reserved solely for the dealing of embassies, which both suggests the volume of diplomatic traffic and indeed it has been estimated that at least 75 ambassadors could be accommodated on the Greco at any one time. Uh, but also suggests an attempt to exert a greater control over the introduction of ambassadors to the Senate. And that introduction was the responsibility of individual magistrates. Indeed, control exerted on the ambassadors in terms of their movement towards their meeting with the Senate was it an expression of the power, and particularly Rome's ability to convene representatives from around the Mediterranean at the centre of Roman political life. Whilst the foreign ambassadors were on display to Rome, as a testimony to the extent of Rome's influence, Rome was also on display to the ambassadors. The forum space, as previously mentioned, was a space of memory, with its monuments serving as testimonies to both political turmoil and successes, frequently utilised by Roman orators as the stage and evidence of their arguments. 
Gilded enemy shields decorated the ex exteriors of the shops which enclosed the forum space uh, from as early as 310 BC and would also decorate the basilicas that would help monumentalize the forum space from the end of the third century BC onwards and more on the basilicas later. The speaker's platform not only carried the beaks of captured ships but was also adorned with statues of Romans who had died, usually by assassination, while serving as ambassadors for Rome. These statues not only acted as a testimony to a Roman audience of the virtues of their home ambassadors, but also, as Glenn Struder has noted, served as a reminder to the importance of the immunity foreign representatives were expected to receive, and didn't necessarily always get. Whilst the main functions of the Comitium area was focused on Roman political life, the introduction of the Graecostasis illustrates how diplomatic space was integrated and became an important part of Rome's self-presentation and mediation of its power relations with other Mediterranean communities. Contact with the Hellenistic world also prompted the introduction of a new building type at Rome that would later become a standard example of Roman architecture. Afrin Welsh has demonstrated that the development of the basilica, a roofed hall with colonnades and a central nave, derives from Hellenistic royal audience halls, the main function of which, uh, and examples are known from palaces of Alexandria and Ptolemaeus in Libya, was to conduct business involving an audience, such as the passing of judgment or hearing of petitions, as well as receiving honoured guests. The Atrium Reginum, the Kingly Hall, is most likely the earliest example of this building type within the forum space, built between 273 and 210 BC, and most likely designed to serve as a space of reception for the kings of the Hellenistic East when they came to Rome. As Welsh argues, the adoption of the building form of the basilica was one of the ways that Romans were able to demonstrate that they were, in a sense, equals of the Hellenistic kings at a time when they still needed to do so. The atrium regenum would be followed by the basilica <coughs> Porcia, built in 184 BC by the censor Marcus Porcius Cato, who at public expense brought up two private atria houses fronting onto the forum. According to ancient sources, Cato was opposed by the Senate, who disliked the idea of him building um, a, a hall in his own name at public expense. Although, as Polybius stresses, in 184 uh, BC, there was such a large number of Greek embassies assembled in Rome that the Senate was unsure as to how to manage them, and apparently it took three days just to introduce all the embassies uh, to the Senate, because there were so many of them. In this respect, the construction of the Basilica Porcia may be understood as an attempt to create more reception spaces for the influx of foreign ambassadors in Rome. The demand for a metropolitan architecture suitable for foreign dignitaries was an indication of the role Rome was taking on for herself within the Mediterranean. Rome as an urban centre was, in part, a product of the creation of diplomatic space. The urban development of Rome also gives us an insight into the changing nature of diplomatic activities. By the 40s BC, the Graecostasis had disappeared from the Roman Forum. Its removal or abandonment seems to coincide with the redevelopment of the west end of the Forum space over the decade from 54 to 44. This period saw the reorientation of both the Curia and the Speaker's platform, structures that were still of political relevance. The removal of the Graecostasis during this period of development must imply that it was no longer necessary or relevant. Were alternative spaces for such an activity used, or was the very activity itself considered redundant? Certainly on the scant records for the actual location of an embassy's reception after the development of the Forum space, and before the development of the new Forum of Augustus, they are no longer held in relation to the Comitium of the Curia, but rather the Temple of Concordia, uh, which is just to the, the top of, of the map. Uh, and this occurs in uh, 44 with the reception of the Jews, and 39 with the reception of the community from Strakonike, and also on the Palatine, and that's in 34, um, a reception from Aphrodisias. Of course, in the period of the 40s and the 30s, there was an intense reorientation of political space occurring. Not only had Caesar physically transformed the western end of the Forum, but the pressures exerted on the political structures led to a decline in power and influence of the Senate. The changing nature of Roman politics thus affected the spaces available for diplomatic activity at Rome. Nevertheless, alternative spaces were, replace, were to replace the function of the Graecostasis, 
and may be seen uh, in the structure known as the Stationes Municipiorum, which was thought to be set up in the space leading from the Roman Forum to the Forum of Julius Caesar, which was just um, north east of the Forum. The spaces and places of diplomatic activity in the political centre of Rome shifted with the shifting political dynamics. As control of the state shifted from the Senate to select individuals, and ultimately one individual, the locky of diplomatic activity shifted around the new focal points. Indeed, from the first century BC AD onwards, envoys sought out an audience with the emperor, even though he would often refer embassies to the Senate, indicating that from an external viewpoint, the emperor was the appropriate locus for diplomatic action. Indeed, Augustus had reorientated the location for diplomatic reception and audience when he built his forum to the east of the Roman Forum space. So that's the Roman Forum, and that's sort of how Augustus's forum. So between the Curia Julia, you have the Forum of Caesar, and then the topmost area is the Forum of Augustus. The forum is decorated with a variety of marbles. Numidian yellow, Phrygian purple, Lucullan black red, Egyptian alabaster all which offered a view of empire and Rome's control over it. The upper stories of the colonnades were decorated with caryatids, representations of the vanquished and shields, whilst personifications of conquered peoples were also on display in the colonnades, as were the statues and inscriptions recording the great men of Rome's past. At the centre of the public space, the Senate set up a quadriga, a four-horse chariot statue of Augustus. The Temple of Mars Altar, Mars the Avenger, dominated the northeast end of the forum space, housing both the cult statue and the military standards that Rome had recaptured from the Parthian Empire. As Suetonius records, Augustus made his forum, and particularly the Temple of Mars the Avenger, the new focal point of Roman military activity and foreign policy. He forced the chiefs of certain barbarians to take oaths in the Temple of Mars the Avenger that they would faithfully keep the peace for which they asked. In some cases, indeed, he tried to exact a new kind of hostage, namely women, realising that the barbarians disregarded pledges secured by males. But all were given the privilege of reclaiming their hostages whenever they wished. He decreed that in it the Senate should consider wars and claims for triumphs. From it, those who are on their way to the provinces with military commands should be escorted, and to it, victors on their return should bear tokens of their triumphs. Thus, when ambassadors came to Rome, peace was negotiated within a display of Roman victory at the Temple of Mars the Avenger. Space within the Forum of Augustus was then an embodiment of the concepts proclaimed in Horace's Carmen Circulare, which was uh, performed as a celebration of the new aid Augustus brought in. Uh, one of the verses claims that now the Scythians and Indians, recently arrogant, seek our reply. Now loyalty and peace dare to return. The Roman historian Valeus, in a brief discussion of all the nations subject to Roma's provinces, records the display of such nations in the Forum of Augustus, Spain and other countries whose names adorn his forum, he writes. Paul Zanka thought that these uh, titles of provinces would have been included within the description beneath the four-horse chariot of Augustus in the centre of the Forum. However, an inscription dedicating a gold statue from Baetica suggests that the names of the pacified nations were inscribed separately from an inscription that was set up, from the inscription that was set up by the Senate. And the inscription from Baetica reads, To Imperator Caesar Augustus, father of his country, because the province was brought under the condition of peace, by his benefaction and perpetual care, further Spain Baetica gives his statue a hundred pounds of golden weight. The gold statue set up on the base was found between the right hand side of the temple and the southern exedra, and it has been suggested that it either represented Augustus or potentially even Baetica herself. Either way, the inscription indicates that the display was intended to illustrate how peace was Augustus' achievement. Indeed, Tacitus refers to gold statues set up in the Forum of Augustus, indicates that such displays were to celebrate victory over foreign nations. Tacitus says that when Valerius Messalinus proposed to set up a gold statue in the Temple of Mars Altar, and Caecina Severa won in the Altar of Vengeance, Tiberius prohibited it, saying again and again that statues were consecrated on accounts of foreign victories, but the domestic misfortunes and grief ought to be concealed. The representation of Baetica, whether through a statue or just the inscription alone, as a pacified province, a provincia peccata, illustrates the place given to foreign peoples and provinces within the context of the history of Roman victory. 
Rome's ability to allow or disallow peace with foreigners is also attested in at least one of the uh, inscriptions to a figure from Rome's past uh, set up in the Forum. The Forum of Augustus was an arena of Roman victory display within which foreign nations came to negotiate peace with Rome. The pacified nations were represented through titles and inscriptions demonstrating their relation to Rome. And it is notable that Baetica terms herself a pacified province. Whilst the focal points of the Roman city had shifted towards the figure of the princeps away from the Senate, there was still a need to integrate space for diplomatic activity in order to stress Rome's position as now the Mediterranean power. So far I've focused on how diplomatic activity influenced the development of urban space at Rome and how in turn spaces for diplomacy were affected by the changing dynamics of Roman power. In what remains I want to examine an example of how Roman use how Rome used space and boundaries to control the movement of foreign embassies, and also how an established norm regarding the legal status of peoples in relation to the city could be manipulated in order to assert a clear message of the foreign state's status. Approaching the city of Rome as a site of diplomacy requires an understanding of how the Romans perceive space and how they define the city in terms of boundaries, limits and movement through the urban fabric. Vira tells us that there are five different types of territory in terms of the categorization. It's, 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 a, it's a bit wordy, but I'll give it a go. There are five categories of territory that our public augurs make distinctions between Roman, of Gabi, foreign, hostile, uncertain. Romulus comes from Rome, which is the name of, sorry, Romanus comes from Rome, which is named from Romulus. Gabinus from the town of the Gabi. Foreign territory is pacified, Picatus, which stands outside the territories of Rome and Gabi, because in this area the auspices are observed in one way. It is called Peregrinus, from Peregrendium, a going, and is from Progrediendum, an advancing, for they first advanced from Roman territory to there. Wherefore, territory of Gabi is also Peregrinus, but because it has the same auspices, it is distinct from the rest. Hosticius comes from hostis, which is public enemy, and incurtus is whatever might be unfamiliar from among these other four territories. <laughs> Categories, sorry. Foreign territory was that, was that which was not categorised as belonging to Rome or Gabi, but was pacatus, pacified, but distinct from that which was hostile. In a similar fashion, Cicero marks the distinction between a person who is pacatus and therefore pacified, and one who is a hostis, a public enemy. Whilst the foreigner's relationship with Rome could be described in terms of peace, the enemy was characterised in relation to war and conflict. But of course, a hostess, a public enemy, could become pacified should they submit to Rome. War and peace were part of the language through which one described the enemies and subjects of the Roman state. This lent a degree of flexibility to how Romans described their relations with other peoples, and ultimately how subject states themselves might describe their relations with Rome. For Rome, then, there was a clear distinction in status between non-Roman pacified peoples and those marked out as hostile. In terms of how Rome conceptualised the city of Rome as a Roman space, juridically, the city, or urbs, was defined well into the 3rd century AD by the line of the Republican city walls. Whilst the sacred limits of the urban domestic space was marked by the pomerium and defined the boundaries between the different different powers a magistrate held within and outside the city, marking two distinct spheres of activity, the foreign and military, and the domestic and political. This is clearly seen in Cicero's account of the assumption and setting aside of military dress at the Pomerium as a visual show of the transition between the two spheres of activity. So he says that short togas were ready for the lictors at the gates, which they took and laid aside their military cloaks so as to form a new crowd for their imperator or their general. By adopting a civilian dress, the toga, the lictors demonstrate that they are now part of the sphere of domestic politics rather than foreign policy. These republican notions of space mark the conceptual divide between the sphere of activity associated with war and that concerned with civic affairs. All diplomatic activity taking place at Rome saw foreign embassies and envoys in movement approaching the city in order to negotiate their positions with Rome. However, the movement of these em embassies was controlled by the Senate, at least in the Republican period. 
as a means of dictating the hierarchy of the relationship. Perhaps the clearest way in which the Senate articulated these boundaries was in the access denied or granted to the herbs itself. Admittedly, our evidence for explicit exclusion from the city is limited. Of the 56 instances of known places of audience in the Republican period, only seven were received extra urban, that is, outside the limits of the herbs, and all of these date to the late 3rd and mid 2nd century BC. But the instances that we do know of allude to the ways in which the Senate could convey much about the position and status of the embassy, even before any official meeting or audience had taken place. The articulation of an embassy's status in relation to the herbs is made clear from a deputation sent from Carthage in 203. The embassy was a peace deputation sent during the 16th year of the Second Punic War. The embassy was escorted by a Roman official from Puteoli, where it had likely landed, and on reaching Rome, it was for forbidden to enter the city. The, the embassy was, however, housed at state expense at the Villa Publica, and granted an audience with the Senate in the Temple of Bologna, the goddess of war. Both these structures were located on the Campus Martius, the Field of Mars, an area defined as outside the herbs, although it was frequently used for gatherings of the people en masse, such as for the levying of troops, given the availability of open space, or the taking of the census. And indeed, the Villa Publica was originally built by the censors, most likely in relation to the census in the mid-5th century BC, and later seems to fit the purpose for housing foreign delegates, among other activities. The Senate was also accustomed to meet here outside the political urban centre when they held audiences with returning Roman generals, who, on account of their imperium, which is the right to command an army, could not cross the boundaries of the herbs, otherwise they would forfeit the power. Ultimately, peace with the Carthaginians was, was not achieved for another two years, and even then they would be hosted outside the city. These delegations were clearly framed as hostile, and given this status, they were not permitted access to the city, <coughs> but were rather received in a space of compromise, still receiving hospitality, but in a space that was orientated around various military aspects of Roman life and away from the political centre, and therefore relegated to a position of uncertainty. The denial of movement into the herbs effectively commenta commented on the legal status of the foreign state in relation to Rome. It is worth noting here that, as far as I'm aware, no other Mediterranean community appears to allow for diplomatic relations, sorry, diplomatic receptions outside city limits. In Greece, the process was binary. Either the ambassadors were accepted into the city and heard by the city council, or they were kept outside the city and not given an audience at all. Rome, too, on occasion, could break the diplomatic dialogue completely by expelling or refusing any access to Rome. But what is striking is the possibilities that an audience outside the herbs could allow in terms of intermediary diplomatic space. This space could be utilised further when articulating ambiguous relations, manoeuvring embassies implicitly into a position that weakened their negotiating powers. For example, the Macedonian king Perseus sent several embassies to Rome in 172 and 171 BC to address accusations set against him by Eumenes, the king of Pergamon. The first embassy of 172 was received by the Senate, and although we are not told where in relation to the city this took place, reference made to a treaty as plausibly existing between Macedon and Rome would suggest that Perseus was not yet viewed as hostile. Nevertheless, the uncertainty of Macedon's relations with Rome was stressed when the Senate denied the embassy access to the speech made by Eumenes before the Senate, only granting the Macedonians an audience several days later. Temporal control that the Senate exercised implied something of the hierarchy of relations with the various foreign states. However, by the start of the following year, conditions had progressed to a point that Rome had decided to declare war against Perseus, without making such a decision public. When the second embassy was sent to Perseus, was sent by Perseus, it was refused entry into the herbs. The envoys are positioned as hostile, even before this status was formally ratified by an assembly of the people. The location of their reception is integral to the ultimate declaration of war, which brings about their immediate expulsion even from the area outside the city. The change in Macedon's relationship with Rome is further articulated with a temporal restriction on the access to the Italian peninsula. Livy tells us that the envoys were given 10 days to get out of Italy, Appian tells us it was 30, 
and also details the dramatic expulsion of all Macedonians who were resident in Rome on that day. Relations with foreign states were fluid and dynamic. The Roman Senate took advantage of the urban experience to express an altered, the altered position of certain embassies in spatial terms. Take, for example, the case of the Rhodians in 167 BC after the end of the Third Macedonian War. Again, it's quite a long passage, but I will read it out because it highlights some important points. Amongst the numerous delegations from Greece, the one from Rhodes excited the greatest interest. They appeared in white garments, as befit their miss mission of congratulations. And indeed, if they had shown themselves in mourning, it might have looked like they were lamenting the fall of Perseus. When the consul, Marcus Junius, consulted the Senate as to whether they would be granted, whether they would grant them free quarters and hospitality and an audience, the House decided that the obligations of hospitality should not be discharged in their case. The envoys, meanwhile, were standing in the Comitium, and when the consul came out of the Senate House, they told them that they had come to offer their congratulations on the victory and to rebut the accusations of treachery, and they begged the Senate would grant them an audience. The consuls told them plainly that it was to friends and allies that the Romans were wont to give hospi uh, an hospi hospitable welcome and grant an audience of the Senate. The conduct of the Rhodians during the war had not been such that they deserved to be counted amongst the friends and allies of Rome. On hearing this, they all prostrate themselves to the ground and implored the consul and all who were present not to think it just and right that new charges which were falsely made against them should outweigh their services in the past, services to which the Romans themselves could testify. They lost no time in putting on mourning garments and visiting the residences of the principal men, whom they implored not to condemn them without a hearing. This account offers much to unpick as regards diplomatic space within Rome. Firstly, although the status of the Rhodians is questioned, they are not granted the status of friends and allies, they are permitted access to the political centre of Rome and are found standing in the Comitium. Here they attempt to get the consul to mediate an audience with the Senate, who remain inside the Senate House. Unfortunately for the Rhodians, they appear to have misjudged their performance. They are dressed to commemorate Rome's victory, perhaps thinking that the access they had gained to the Comitium was enough, also based on their previous experiences in 201 and 188 to ensure a favourable reception and access to the Senate and hospitality at state expense. They are quickly made to publicly realise that they are not playing the right role, and so change into the guise of suppliants, and will reduce the trying to find a magistrate who would mediate for them for the Senate. Indeed, in Livy's later account, the Rhodians themselves go as far as to outline how their position had changed in spatial terms over several decades of diplomatic relations with Rome. In the past, when we visited Rome, after the Carthaginians were defeated, uh, and after Philip and Antiochus had been overcome, we went from our quarters, where we were guests of the state, to offer our congratulations in the Senate House, and from there we went up to the Capitoline, with gifts for your gods. Now we have come away from a miserable inn, where we could hardly get admission, ordered as we were to remain outside the city, almost as if we were enemies. In this squalid plight, we have come into the Roman Senate House. The Rhodians are made very aware of their precarious position, treated as virtual enemies, whereas before they had full access to Rome's hospitality and central sites, including the Temple of Jupiter Optus Maximus on the Capitoline, where successful embassies were permitted to offer gifts at the conclusion of negotiations. Their treatment forces them to adopt a new role, seeking out a patron who would support their application. This most likely involves daily visits to the houses of the elite, to take part in the ritual of salutatio, whereby the clients of the patrons would attend him in the atrium, the vestibule of his house, in the morning, in hope that he might aid them. We find an account of such activities undertaken by two envoys from Teos, which is on the Ionian coast of Turkey, uh, honoured by the city of Abdera on the coast of Thrace, for acting on their behalf against the king of Thrace. They met the Roman leading men, winning them over by their daily salutations, and they induced the Roman patrons of our country to come to the aid of our people. And when some of the Romans preferred our antagonist and stood in his defence, by the exposition of the situation and by daily morning calls to the Atria, our envoys won over their friendship. What is most striking in this Greek inscription is the transliteration of the Latin words Patroni and Atria demonstrating the Greeks' awareness of the socially embedded spatial practices of the Roman world. They were effectively absorbed into the Roman social practice of patrons and clients, involving personal ties and a sort of reciprocal relationship of favours, 
and attempted to make that system work for them. This also adds another layer to our understanding of what constitutes diplomatic space at Rome that would extend into the imperial period. Personal relations needed to be established with individual political figures, and such negotiation was carried out in a domestic residential context, wherein a similar type of spatial and temporal control could be exerted by the patron. This is demonstrated in the extreme case of the Jewish Alexandrian embassy that sought an audience with the Emperor Gaius in 40 AD, as recorded by Philip of Alexandria, who was one of the delegates. Now, under Augustus, we saw that negotiations with foreign dignitaries were still conducted, at least formally, in public space in the Forum of Augustus. In the case of the embassy to Gaius, made by, by the Jews, the location of their interactions with the emperor are all centered around imperial villas and estates, either in or around Rome or at Puteoli in southern Italy. The location of the audience shifts and moves with the person of the emperor. They first meet Gaius as he exits an estate on the far side of the Tiber, the gardens of his mother Agrippina. The embassy gets off to a good start. Uh, with Gaius informing uh, his manager of ambassadors, he even has you know, an official who's meant to oversee uh, the organisation of the embassies coming to him, to see, see to it that he actually will hear their case in person. The Jewish embassy receives congratulations from all the other envoys who are likewise waiting, though have yet to receive any promise of an audience. Here the emperor is able to convene all the foreign embassies around him by his very presence, rather than the specific spatial control the Senate ex exercised in the Roman Forum. The expectation the promised audience, in fact, uh, the expectation of the promised audience, in fact, prompts the embassy to follow Gaius down to Puteoli, whilst he inspects various villas, then back to Rome, where they are summoned to attend him as he inspects yet more residences and gardens ranging over the eastern borders of the city. During the audience, which is not condu conducted in one single space, but on the move as Gaius goes around all the various buildings and rooms, uh, the emperor's focus is intently on the physical space around him as a display of his complete control over the meeting and his disregard of the actual content of the Jews' case. And Philo tells us, We started to speak and give him information, but when he'd had a taste of our pleading and recognised that there it was by, by no means contemptible, he cut short our earlier points before we could bring in stronger ones, and dashed at high speed into the large room of, of the house, and walked around it and ordered the windows all around be restored with transparent stones, which, in the same way as white glass, do not obstruct the light, but keep off the wind and scorching sun. Such was his combination of a theatre and a prison in place of a tribunal. The finds of, from the Horti, uh, Horti of Marcellus and Lamia are ornate and rich, just a few examples, and give some insight into the grandeur and luxury on display which the embassies were paraded through at the whim of the emperor. Philo, who was present on all these sites of diplomatic exchange with Gaius, was well aware of the theatrical nature of the performance he was witnessing, but was also being forced to take part in. Over the centuries, from Republic to early Empire, the urban fabric of Rome had developed, first into a Hellenistic metropolis, influenced by interactions with the Eastern Mediterranean, and the desire to provide suitable spaces and platforms on which to negotiate power and then into an imperial cosmopolis, to borrow the concept from Catherine Edwards and Greg Wolfe. The sites of Roman diplomacy became increasingly sublime as the city's monumentality was designed to impress not merely its inhabitants, but the whole traffic of the Mediterranean and beyond that moved in and out of the city. The importance of controlling and manipulating such movement and the spaces within which Rome received embassies remained a key means through which Rome negotiated her position as a dominant power in the Mediterranean, even after the emperor had long since abandoned the city as an imperial seat, only to return as a foreigner to be submitted to the sublime diplomacy that was Rome.